Hi everyone, Nathan Yates here with the Tech Service Department. Welcome to our spring training. What we're going to do this year is talk about a couple of topics conceptually that will revolve around your spring startup and then we're going to apply that to the actual equipment for a hands-on approach and how that's going to look in the field. So let's begin. Welcome to day one of our spring training. What we're going to cover today are four main topics that we get calls in to tech service on spring startup. So let's take a look at our agenda and see what we have going on today. The first thing that we're going to cover is how to test a reversing valve. The second thing we're going to look at is capacitor facts. The third thing is we're going to go over compressor diagnosis. And the final thing that we're going to look at is testing an ECM blower motor and how that looks out in the field. And throughout the presentation, if you have any questions that were to come up, feel free to submit those and we're going to take a look at those at the end. So when testing a reversing valve, the main thing that I want you guys to grasp is what lines are what in heating and in cooling mode, and then how do you actually test the reversing valve to determine whether it's a good or a bad part. So the diagram that we have here is your refrigeration diagram for a heat pump in cooling mode. So what we have is our indoor coil, which is our evaporator, or outdoor coil, which is our condenser. We have our reversing valve and then our compressor. The first thing that I want to drive home here is the common suction line on a heat pump. So the middle line that comes off your reversing valve, that is your common suction line that makes its way all the way back to the compressor on the suction side of the compressor. So that does not change at all. So this line is going to be your common suction in heat pump mode and in cooling mode. Now on our 13 and 14 sear units, what you may see, for example, is our common suction line port. And you will need to hook in your low side hose on that port in order to read your suction side pressure. On our other pieces of equipment, we also do have a suction port as well. Uh, but especially on our 13 and 14 sear, that port is how you're going to get your suction pressure reading. So again, the middle line coming off your reversing valve is going to be suction at all times, whether you're in heat or in cooling mode. Now the discharge line that comes off your compressor, that is going to be thrown either to your outdoor coil or your indoor coil, depending on whether you're in cooling or in heating mode. Per our diagram here, we have it in cooling mode. So our discharge pressure coming off our compressor is going to our outdoor coil in cooling mode. Now, if we were to switch over to heat pump mode, our discharge pressure would be going into what would be this blue line. So this line would turn red essentially in heat pump mode and we would be throwing hot gas into the indoor coil during heat pump mode operation. The biggest thing is, is that to know with our 13 and our 14 sear units, this line is now your high side when checking your pressure. So this essentially is your discharge line in heat pump mode. It's important to know when testing a reversing valve, depending on what mode you're in. Now, some symptoms of a bad reversing valve would be the following. These are a couple things. So one, you'll have low head pressure. You'll have low compressor amp draw. Third thing is, is that your suction pressure is going to be higher and you'll also have high discharge pressure. Now, just to add to that a little bit, your low head pressure uh, portion of that um, would be is that if your reversing valve is stuck kind of in the middle, that discharge pressure that's coming off of the compressor is kind of going to be split, if you will. So half of it's going to go to uh, one side of the valve, which will be your high side, and the other, si the other half of it's going to go to your low side uh, portion of the valve. And that's why you can have a low head pressure and a high suction pressure um, when you hook gauges up to your system. Um, also, too, on your amp draw portion of it, um, when you don't have that differential of pressure, you're basically cycling refrigerant right there at the reversing valve. And as a result, the compressor doesn't have to work as hard to pump. So you'll end up having a lower amp draw on that. Now, how do we test a reversing valve uh, in the field? So 
This can be performed in heating or in cooling mode. So no matter whether you're uh, summertime or wintertime, you can do it either way. Basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna take line temperatures right at the reversing valve. So you wanna use a thermocouple type thermistor versus a laser, for example, to actually take these temperatures because what you're dealing with is roughly about two to four degrees of temperature difference. So you wanna be as, as accurate as you possibly can when looking at these temperatures. So first, what you'll do is you'll take your common suction line temperature, which again, if we look at a reversing valve, it's gonna be our middle line here um, coming off our valve. So that'll be one spot that you'll take your line temperature. And again, uh, you're always gonna take your common suction line temperature, whether you're in heat or in cooling mode. Now, determining whether you're in heat or cooling mode, the second probe is gonna go on one of your two outside lines here. And that'll determine whether, uh, again, you're in heat or cool mode um, because it's all based upon where your evaporator is. So in cooling mode, your evaporator is gonna be your indoor coil and in heat pump mode, your evaporator is your outdoor coil. So a real easy way to look at this is, is that one of these lines coming off the valve is gonna go to your indoor coil and the other line is gonna go to your outdoor coil. So essentially, if you're in cooling mode and you wanna test your reversing valve, you take your middle line temperature and then you take the line that will be going to your indoor coil. What you're looking for under a good reading is roughly about two to four degrees of temperature difference. Um, it can be as high as about six or so, um, but what I would consider normal is about two to four degrees. So if you're within that range, your valve is good and we may need to look elsewhere um, as far as a problem goes. Like maybe we have an inefficient compressor or something like that that we need to diagnose. Uh, but two to four, again, is what you're looking at for a good reversing valve. So now let's go take a look at a reversing valve on a unit. When it comes to troubleshooting a reversing valve, you wanna make sure you use the proper tools to test the valve. You can either use a thermocouple type thermistor or if you have a digital gauge set, you can use the clamp thermistors that would come with your digital gauges. So let's get into the unit and take a look at the valve. First thing that you wanna do is unwire your condenser fan motor and then take the screws out to then take the top off. So let's do that. First thing I wanna point out to you guys is one, this line here is gonna be our common suction line. It goes back to our compressor. Second thing is, is this is your discharge line here. And this part is a muffler, which often gets confused as a filter dryer, but this is just a muffler. And when it comes to your reversing valve, you'll have three lines that come off the bottom of the valve. And then you'll have your discharge line that comes on the top. Now again, this line runs through your muffler and back to your compressor. Your three lines coming off the valve will either go to your suction service port, which comes down over here. You'll have a line here that goes to your common uh, suction port gauge hookup. So anytime that you connect to this line, you're always gonna read suction pressure because that tracks back to the middle line on the reversing valve. And then what you'll have is another line coming off the other side of the valve, which essentially goes to your outdoor coil. So essentially, the easiest way to look at this is, is that you have one line that goes to the indoor coil, and then you have another line that goes to the outdoor coil. You will also have your common suction port hookup to read suction pressure in heat pump mode. Now, when it comes to placing your probes to test the reversing valve, you wanna get as close to the valve as you can because you're only dealing with a handful of degrees uh, when testing your reversing valve. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna use our thermal clamps from our digital gauge setup and we're gonna clip on to our common suction line. So this comes in through the bottom of the valve and that's our middle line. And then per our test here, we're gonna test this unit in cooling mode. So what we'll do is we'll take this line here put our clamp amp on that. So again, this line goes out to your common suction port on the unit. And then what we'll do 
with our wires here, we're just gonna feed this through where our refrigerant lines exit the unit. And then we'll re-hook into our gauges. Okay, so now we have our clamps installed. So again, we're gonna measure our common suction line. Um, and then since we're gonna run the unit in cooling mode, we're gonna check the line that goes to our evaporator coil. Now, if we were gonna test this in heat pump mode, we would basically put our, our other clamp, this clamp here, we're, we would have placed it on this line because your outdoor coil is your evaporator coil in heat pump mode. So we're gonna run this unit in cooling mode and see what our reversing valve tests to. So let's get the top of the unit on and take a look. And now with our condenser fan motor rewired in, let's run the unit and see what our reversing valve tests to. Let's take a look. So currently right now, what we're looking at is, let's call it 60 degrees on our uh, STL line. And then on our liquid line temp uh, line, we've got about 66. So we're within about that seven degree range that we want to be at. It's a little bit cooler in this room. So, you know, our temperatures are a little bit farther away than what I would want. But basically you want to be about seven degrees on the differential on your reversing valve. Now, another thing you can keep in mind is when we were doing this test, I had to put the top of the unit back on. And that's mainly due to the fact that this is a good unit. And if I didn't put the lid back on with the condenser fan motor, the unit would go off on high head pressure. Now in the field, the symptoms that you would get for a bad reversing valve generally are gonna be a uh, suction pressure and a head pressure are gonna be really close together. And you're really not gonna be worried about going off on head pressure pretty quick. So when you're out in the field doing this test, just take the top off, leave it off, stick your probes in there on your common suction line and then whatever line coming off the bottom on that reversing valve, whether you're gonna be testing it in cooling mode or in heat pump mode and take your temperature readings. Um, again, seven degrees is about your max that you wanna be at. If you're over that, we wanna make sure that the test that we're performing is accurate as it can possibly be, that we're using thermal couples and not lasers to test the line temperatures. Cause you don't wanna go through that whole process of a changing reversing valve and it not be a reversing valve. So with that, let's go into capacitor facts and see what we got. And the first thing that I want you guys to know about capacitors is one, capacitors don't actually amplify the voltage. You can see a higher voltage across a capacitor, but this is due to the back EMF generated by the motor and not the actual capacitor. The second thing that we wanna take a look at is higher the capacitance, the higher the current on the start winding. The higher the MFD on the capacitor, the greater the stored energy and the greater the start winding amperage. Oversizing a capacitor can cause damage to a compressor or to a motor. So this is very important that you wanna make sure if you're replacing a capacitor, say on a condenser unit, you don't want to oversize that capacitor. So a couple things. One, Copeland does have an app that you can use to see what capacitors go with that certain type of compressor. You're also welcome to call into tech service and we can look up to see what capacitor goes with that unit. Um, but the main thing is, is that you never wanna oversize that capacitor for that compressor or that motor, uh, cause you'll end up damaging the windings on that, on that motor or compressor. Third thing is, is that the voltage rating on the cap is what it can handle and not what it will produce. Meaning, you can replace a 370 volt rated capacitor with a 440 volt, but you can't replace a 440 volt with a 370 rated capacitor. Basically, you can't go down in voltage, but you can go up. So uh, that's the other thing is if you're replacing a capacitor and you're not sure which one to do, if you have a 440 volt capacitor, you can't go down to a 370. But if it's the other way around, you can. And the last thing that we're gonna look at is testing in a capacitor. So there's two ways that you can do this. The first way is that you can take all the wires off the capacitor and you can actually just de-energize the capacitor and then use your meter and test the microfarad reading on that capacitor by using the battery in your meter. 
The second thing is, which is really the more accurate way, is to test a capacitor when it's under load. So, what you want to do is you want to measure the amps off the start winding coming off the capacitor, and you want to times that number by 2652. Then what you'll do is divide that by the voltage taken between the common and the Herm terminal on the capacitor. And now let's take a look at a map on what it would look like when you test a capacitor under load. So per our picture here, what I have is two meters. Um, one meter is gonna be testing voltage. The other meter is gonna be testing the amp draw on the compressor. So first thing that you wanna do is grab the compressor start wire that goes down to your Herm terminal on the capacitor. You wanna take that amp draw. So per our example here, our amp draw is 7.8, so just you'll write that down, 7.8. And then the second thing that you'll want to do is take a voltage reading on your capacitor. And per our example, our, our voltage reading is 292.9 volts on our meter. Now, what you'll end up doing is taking your amp draw and you're going to times that by 2652. And then you'll take that number and divide it by your voltage and that will end up giving you a more truer number of your MFD or your microfarad reading on your capacitor. So again, this is a more accurate way to test a capacitor under load because what you're actually using for the voltage is the voltage coming right off the capacitor instead of say the nine volt battery that might be in your meter or maybe you might have a couple of double A AA or triple A's. So you're using a lot more voltage to get a more accurate reading on what the capacitor is actually giving you. Now let's take a look at a unit and see what it looks like in the field. All right guys, so what I have here is a 14 tier heat pump running in cooling mode. So let's take a look and see what this capacitor is reading out to under a loaded condition. So what you'll do first is just take a clamp amp meter we're going to clip around our red wire here that's going to our Herm from our compressor. So right now we're reading, let's call it 3.8 amps on that. So when we come down to our equation here, we'll do 3.8 times 2652. And the next reading that we're going to take is our voltage reading on our capacitor. So we'll set up our meter here for AC volts. And we're going to check our common and our Herm terminal on our capacitor. And we're reading about 292, 293, let's call it 293. So we're reading 293 volts on our capacitor. All right, so now we're gonna do 293. So if we were to do the math on this, we're gonna do 3.8 times 2652 divided by 293, and that's gonna equal 34.39. So 34, MFD is what we're reading on this capacitor. Now on the capacitor that we have for this unit, it is a 35 slash five. So we are well within range on our microfarad reading for our cap. So your buffer zone on your capacitor is plus or minus 10%. So we're well within 10% of 35. So in this situation, our capacitor checks out good, and there would be no reason to replace it or, uh, or anything like that. So with that, let's go right into compressor diagnosis. One key thing that you wanna look at when diagnosing a compressor is the ohm values on the compressor. It's important to know which terminals are which and what resistance readings that you need to look for. This applies to your common, your start, and your run winding. When calling into tech service, we may ask for the ohm values on the compressor. 
When taking ohm readings, this needs to be performed on the compressor terminals and not the wires. The main reason for this is that we don't want to include the actual resistance readings of the wires in your overall um, value of taking ohms. You want to actually take the ohms directly on the compressor terminals themselves. Now, you may ask, well, what should my ohm values be? Well, this can be a little bit different on the compressor manufacturer and the actual model of the compressor. But say for single phase compressors, this answer in general can be found with the compressor manufacturer as far as what your ohms are gonna be for that particular model. Now, some manufacturers actually have apps that you can um, download on your phone or you can go to their website and look at the model number of the compressor and that um, can tell you what the actual ohm values we need to be for that particular model number. Now, when it comes to your common start and run terminal on the compressor, uh, we get questions in tech about this as well. So your lowest ohm reading is going to be between your common and your run terminal. So your run winding is going to be your lowest ohm value on your compressor. Your second value that's going to be higher than that is going to be your start winding. So your start winding is always going to be higher than your run winding when it comes to your ohm value. And then your third highest thing is going to be your resistance reading that's going to include your run and your start terminal uh, on the compressor. So you're actually going to be reading both windings together and that's going to give you your highest reading. Now, uh, just to reiterate that, again, your start winding is going to be higher than your run. Now, one thing I also want to point out here too is that a lot of guys like to use alligator clips to test the ohm values on a compressor. We kind of want you guys to stray away from that if you were to ask us in tech service because what you really want is the needle points on your meter to make solid contact when you're checking ohm values on your compressor. And it all comes down to the overall uh, connectivity of the actual meter lead instead of the alligator clip that you would maybe use out in the field. Uh, because again, if you don't have a solid connection on your terminals, um, you may get a different reading depending on um, if you use your alligator clips versus if you just use your meter leads themselves on that. So with that being said, let's take a look at a compressor and see what that looks like. All right guys, so what I got here is a Copeland scroll compressor, and then I also have a Copeland that's scroll that's also got a cutaway on it. But let's go ahead and ohm this compressor out and see what we got. So on our top terminal here, this is actually gonna be our common. Uh, so if we go from our common to our run, see what we got. We got about a 0.9 for ohms. And now let's go over to our start. Got a, about a 1.8. And now let's go between our run and our start terminal, which should be our highest ohm value. And that's going to be 2.4, about 2.5 or so. So this compressor checks out okay. Now, if you were ohming a compressor to ground, basically what you would do, and again, you want to do that directly on these pins. Uh, so you'll pull the plug off the compressor, put one meter lead on each of the pins, the other meter lead can go just directly to copper as your ground, and then you, you'll just go to each terminal to ground. And what you want to see on your meter is OL when it comes to ohming these three pins out to ground. If you either read a number on your meter or zero, we've got a grounded compressor at that point. So um, when ohming those terminals out, uh, that's kind of what you want to read under a good compressor. Now, let's take a look at troubleshooting an ECM blower motor. And the main three things that can take out an ECM motor are the following. The first thing is going to be related to line voltage. The max line voltage that you would want to have, say, on an air handler is 253 volts. I usually tell guys 250 is your max, so it gives you a little bit of a buffer zone on that. But 253 is the max voltage that you would want to see, say, on an air handler for an ECM blower motor. The second thing is going to be related to moisture. This is going to be really easy when it comes to troubleshooting because you're either going to have water or you're not going to have water in your blower compartment. Now, when it comes to water, the main thing is if you were to come up on a unit that's installed horizontally, 
you just want to make sure that that unit is installed at at least level or if not pitched forward a little bit so any water and condensation that would be produced by the evaporator coil and cooling mode can drain uh, effectively out into your drain system. The third thing is, is going to be static pressure. Now, when it comes to static pressure, this directly reflects the performance of your system and your overall CFM output to your registers. Now, the higher your static pressure, the lower your CFM output is going to be. So in turn, like for example, on the variable speed setup, that blower motor, if you were to have a higher static, is gonna to have to work harder in order to push the CFM output that you have selected for that install. So if it's gotta work a lot harder in order to push that CFM for an extended period of time, it may prematurely go out on you, mainly due to a high static pressure. So if we were to have a motor failure on say a furnace or an air handler, how do we test it? Well, what you can do is you can use our broad ocean motor tester. And what this will do is that this will help eliminate whether or not you have a board or a motor problem. So with the tester, uh, it's powered by 24 volts by the blower board. And then you'll also have a green light that will indicate the horsepower on the motor. So simply put, if the motor runs when using the motor tester, we need to troubleshoot the board and we may need a new board from our distributor. If the motor doesn't run when we use the tester, then we need to replace the blower motor in that furnace or air handler. So now let's take a look at a piece of equipment and how this will look in the field. So what we have here is our broad ocean motor tester. Uh, it's gonna say broad ocean right on it. This is the tester that we tell you guys to use to troubleshoot our fixed and variable speed blower motors that you will find in our air handlers and our furnaces. So when you get the tester, you're gonna have three different adapters that are gonna come with this tester. So for our example today, we're working on a G7 furnace, so we're gonna use uh, this adapter here. So basically all you do is you take your adapter, plug it into the tester, and then you'll just tighten down these screws here. All right, and then you'll have your Molex plug on the other side. And what you'll do with this guy is take your blower motor plug off your blower board. Now this again is 24 volts, low voltage, and it's gonna plug right into the tester. You hear a little click, it goes in one way and then your two wires coming off the bottom of your tester is where you're gonna tag 24 volts. So on our particular furnace, we have a variable speed set up. So I'm gonna tag the R in the C terminal off this blower board. Put this on here, all right. And this is what will power our tester. So once you apply power to the tester, you'll have a red LED power light that'll come on. And then once you turn the tester on, meaning turning the blower on, you'll have a green LED along the bottom here that will tell you what the horsepower is of the blower motor we're testing. So for our example, we've got a half horsepower motor that we're testing. So right now I have the selector switch on low. And if I were to go to high, that blower motor is going to ramp up a little bit. And then if we go back down to low, that blower motor is going to ramp back down. And then if we go to off, the blower motor is going to shut completely off and then we lose our green LED to determine what horsepower motor it is. So this is a really handy tool to determine whether or not you may have a motor issue or a board. And just remember that the tester essentially takes the place of the board. So if the motor runs with your tester, your motor's just fine. And we would need to look elsewhere for troubleshooting. And again, that's how we test our ECM blower motors on our furnaces and air handlers. And let's take a look at the questions that have been submitted and feel free to go ahead and submit more questions as we go along. So we have some questions rolling in. Let's look at the questions that have been submitted and we'll get to those. So let's take a look. 
All right, so first question, uh, let's see, reads at, um, why can't you use a laser when reading temperatures on lines? So the main reason why you don't want to use a laser when you take line temperatures um, is because the accuracy of the temperature is going to be directly reflected upon the reflective surface that that laser is hitting. So especially if you're outside, those copper lines are going to, um, you know, as copper gets older, it'll have a coating on it, you know, versus if it's brand new. So um, that's m the main reason why is, is it's the reflective surface versus when you use a thermocouple um, to where you're actually getting a physical temperature of the line versus a reflective surface on the line. Um, the other thing, at least when it comes to reversing valves, is that you're only dealing with a handful of degrees. So you want to make sure that you go and you, and you take those temperatures as accurate as you can because you want to make sure that one, it is a bad reversing valve before you go through the hassle of changing it. Um, but mainly it's, it's accuracy on why you really don't want to use a laser. Um, and you want to use any kind of thermocouple type thermistor. Um, could be anything from like what we used uh, with the digital gauge set. It could be old school where you just have a straight up thermocouple where you strap to the line. Um, some guys will d have a uh, thermistor where um, you can tape it to the line, which is fine. Um, but mainly one of those three things is what you want to use when you're checking line temperatures. Um, that kind of goes along with coming, in, coming into springtime when you're looking at your superheat and your subcooling numbers because um, that can greatly improve your troubleshooting when you're troubleshooting your refrigeration circuit, um, you know, because you don't want to start replacing parts or uh, removing refrigerant or adding refrigerant when you may or may not have to. So it's accuracy and the reason behind it is just the reflective surface on it. So that, that's why. Okay, so another question coming in is um, just in relation back to the capacitor. So the reason why you want to do it when the unit's running is because you're getting the full voltage off the capacitor to give you an accurate reading um, on your meter. So um, if you were to take the wires off, de-energize the, the, the capacitor and then use your meter, again, you're only using that nine volts or if you got double or triple A's in your, in your meter um, to then energize that capacitor and to test the microfarads on it. Um, when you go and you um, uh, test that capacitor under load, uh, you're using that full voltage that we that we read as as your actual voltage when the unit is running. So again, it, it all like boils down to accuracy, same as the temp probe uh, question. Um, so you know when we read that on the capacitor, we read really close to our our stated 35 um, on our cap. So. Um, would you have gotten that close if you would have read it with, with just a meter? Um, you know, maybe, maybe not. I, I'd have to actually take a look at that and, and see what the, what the difference is on that. But it might be something you can do in the field uh, just to kind of see the difference on it. But that's the main reason is because you're using the full voltage of the cap uh, to give you the most accurate reading. And, and pretty much we were dead on on that capacitor. Uh, we have another question here is what brand is the ECM tester? So the brand is Broad Ocean, so it's going to say Broad Ocean on that tester. Right in the middle, uh, right above that selector switch, it's going to say Broad Ocean. So um, that's something that you guys can pick up from the distributor. Um, it, it, the, the, the tester makes it a lot easier to troubleshoot that motor. It basically will break it down for you whether you have a blower board problem or you have a blower motor problem. Um, um, 
you know, because mainly you want to double check your line voltage going to the blower motor. And then when it comes to low voltage, you want to, um, you want to use that tester. So it's Broad Ocean as far as the brand on it. Uh, another question is, uh, relating back to the capacitor portion of this, is when we did the amps of 2652, uh, that is just part of the mathematical equation as far as your amps go. Um, so that's just a, just a math thing um, for, that, for that equation on finding your capacitor um, uh, microfarads under a loaded condition on that. Uh, just an, again, where can you find the, uh, the motor tester? Uh, the motor tester can be found uh, through your distributor. Uh, so uh, just contact your local branch and, um, and, and see if they have that available for you, which I would hope that they would. Um, but the tester can be found through uh, your distributor. Um, another like side note that I'll say to the tester is, um, other manufacturers use broad ocean motors. We're not the only one. Um, so we get uh, questions sometimes is, can you use that tester on other brands? And um, because it comes with other adapters. So my answer to that question is that we get into tech is, you could try it. What, what the main reason why you may not be able to is coming down to the programming on the motor. So it's not so much of a, as a physical plug dimension that it won't work uh, or may or may not work. It's mainly just um, the program on the board or the program on the motor on that. Uh, another uh, question is, I guess we had lost connection at some point so during this uh, presentation. So I'll get with our communications department. I would think we would be putting this up on EdgeTech, um, which is our training website. So um, I'll get with them, but I'm sure we'll put that up there. Um, not sure if this is going to be posted on YouTube or not, but that would be another spot that you guys could find it. Um, but I'll get with our communications department and see uh, if we can get this on edge tech, which I'm sure it will be. So, but I'll double check on that. So we still have questions coming in, guys. So any anything that comes to mind over the over the few topics that we covered today, just feel free to uh, swing away and, and we'll get to these here. So um, another question uh, came in in regards to the low voltage side going to the blower motor and can you test that? Um, so the answer to that question is, is that the voltage that goes to the blower motor um, is a pulsating uh, low voltage, so it's not a true 24 volt that you can measure, which is why you want the tester. So on some other brands of equipment, you can go in and actually test the low voltage on the plug. Um, but on, um, on this motor, the, the, communicate, or the, the voltage that goes from the blower board to the blower motor is going to be a pulsating voltage that goes there. So that's why you want to use the tester to, uh, to use that. Um, and, um, and basically what I tell guys in the field is that voltage is non-measurable because it can range anywhere from a handful of volts um, all the way up to 24. So that's kind of what you're looking at on that as far as the low voltage. Guys, if you have any other questions, feel free to, to submit them here. Uh, what I will say tomorrow, um, 
as far as what we'll kind of be covering is checking charge on a unit. Um, so that's, uh, and we'll also look at the uh, charge calculator. So that will be a, a little bit that, um, um, uh, as far as a troubleshooting tool that we're going to look at tomorrow. So just kind of going to give you guys a heads up on what tomorrow is going to look like. Um, it'll be the same type of format. Uh, we'll have a, uh, like a hands-on kind of an instructional video. We'll do a Q&A just like today. Um, and, and then also too, I had another question as far as the length on, on these trainings. Uh, it'll just be about an hour long or so. Uh, might run a little less just depending on how questions fill in. Uh, for today and tomorrow, so. Um, just another thing, um, another question in relation to ohming a compressor. Uh, I just want to reiterate that you want to use your actual meter leads and not uh, those alligator clips, uh, mainly because if you have an alligator clip that's not on there solid or if it kind of like wiggles around a little bit, you're not going to have, you know, a good full solid connection on there. and especially when you're checking ohms, connections are everything. Um, especially, you know, as you guys probably know, coming out of furnace season when you're ohming out uh, safeties and stuff like that, um, a loose connection can certainly throw you uh, for a loop. So um, when it comes to checking ohms on a compressor, that's not gonna change. So you wanna make sure that you use your needle points on your meter leads. Um, and you want to do that again on the terminals and not include uh, the wires within your calculation on that. Um, one thing that I did find uh, helpful is if you want to try to find the ohm value on the type of compressor that you're working on. Um, for example, Copeland has a really good app. Um, and basically all you do is you just start typing in the model number of the compressor and it'll just bring up a very short list of tech data. And the main thing that um, I would be searching for in relation to ohms is what does the compressor ohm out to? And it will give you what the run winding should ohm out to. It'll also give you what the start will ohm out to. And then obviously you'll just add those together when you check your, comp when you check your start and your run terminal. Um, but it's a really easy app if you guys aren't familiar with it. Um, um, to, to, to find that information um, a lot easier than going to their actual home page on a browser um, as far as that goes. Uh, the other thing that I'll, I'll just kind of point out too is um, I had a call yesterday on our inverter driven line of units on our BG line. It was on our 18 sear uh, inverter driven heat pump. And um, the other reason why you don't want to include the wires within your reading is because when you own one of those compressors out, for example, um, the ohm value on that compressor is going to be right at one ohm between each terminal. Now, those compressors don't have your traditional common start and run windings like you would say on a 14 sear unit. Um, so it's very critical on the inverter driven stuff that you do measure it on the terminals um, because you're only dealing with about an ohm's worth of value. Um, basically, as far as how we have it stated out is you don't want to read over 1.5 on our BG line on our AC and our heat pump inverter driven unit. And there, the, the wires that go from um, the compressor all the way to uh, where the terminal block is, um, they're, they're longer wires. So you can definitely pick up some resistance on that um, when you're checking for ohms. Um, the other thing in relation to the BG line is that um, the ohm values between each of your terminals um, need to be within about 0.2 ohms of each other. So we're talking very little ohms here. Now, um, in relation to my actual call is that that compressor was grounded. Um, and just as a reminder on our inverter driven stuff, if you have a grounded compressor, 
it's not going to trip the breaker like it would on a 13 or a 14 sear, um, for example. So um, just a little bit of insight on our BG um, inverter driven condensers because it's a little bit different um, than what we covered today on that. Uh, so another question in relation to uh, using a hard start kit. So if you're pulling locked rotor amps, um, you'd want to try to use a hard start kit to try to turn the compressor over. Uh, mainly we only tell guys to use a hard start kit if uh, you have an incoming line voltage problem and that would be on the low side. So if you have a low uh, line voltage coming into the unit, that's when you'd want to use a hard start kit. Again, guys, if you have any questions, feel free to submit them. Again, uh, the motor tester can be found at your local distributor. Uh, just a reminder on that for, your, for the blower motor. Um, the other thing with that tester, you'd be able to, in relation to our inverter driven line, you'd be able to test that um, condenser fan motor with that motor tester. Um, just kind of as a side note on that. So uh, going, uh, so we have another question in relation to the, the reversing valve. So when it comes to a bad reversing valve, most of the time the issue is is that uh, when techs call us, it's going to be a very high suction pressure, a low head pressure, the amp draw on the compressor is going to be low. So a lot of guys want to jump to a bad compressor. Um, and basically what happens is, is if you follow the, the refrigerant piping um, in a, just like a 14 or a 13 sear unit, um, the, the, the line that comes off the top of the reversing valve is the, your discharge line that comes off the compressor. So a lot of times that discharge pressure is going to like split in half, if you will, which is why your pressures kind of level off a little bit. Um, so your suction pressure comes up, your head pressure drops, and then you end up cycling refrigerant there at the valve. Um, so, you know, that, that's, that's the common um, uh, symptom that we get um, when it comes to reversing valve. And basically what it is is that um, either there's a problem with the, um, uh, the seal in there or it's not seated properly when it's shifting from heat to cool mode. Um, say during defrost mode, when it's in cooling mode technically, and then when it goes back over to heat pump mode, um, you know, obviously you're running in, in, in heating mode at that time. So um, basically it's just like the, the, the internals of the valve uh, get hung up or something gets stuck, which then instead of throwing the, the full discharge pressure coming off that compressor, um, essentially onto your high side and into your condenser coil, whether that would be your outdoor for cooling or your indoor for heat pump mode, it's basically splitting it in half. I mean, it may not be 50-50, but you know, um, you know, you may have a, um, uh, like a suction pressure of uh, like a 170, for example. Um, and if you were to have that um, in relation to other refrigerant troubleshooting, you'd want to test your valve um, to make sure you're not bypassing refrigerant there. But another good thing is on the electrical side is to test your amp draw on the compressor. So if your amp draw is really low, that's another sign that we have a bad reversing valve because you're just cycling refrigerant there at the valve.
So uh, another question in regards to um, like just general troubleshooting when it comes to the boards um, for our 14 sear and our inverter driven stuff uh, per our question here. So to find any kind of like troubleshooting information, the best place that I could point you to is the install instructions um, because um, in our install instructions, especially in our inverter driven stuff, we give uh, descriptions of the codes and kind of the breakdown of the codes. I know when you're on job site and you see that uh, massive code list on the BG or the, or the handful of codes, say on a 14 sphere heat pump, uh, we, we give a description of the code, but we don't really um, tell you what to look for or tell you exactly what it is. So uh, sometimes, and majority of the time, that kind of revolves around our inverter driven stuff because that can be a little more complicated, obviously, than just a 14 sphere unit. Um, but the best place that I would point you to is to uh, the install instructions for that particular piece of equipment. Um, other avenues that you can uh, look at for, um, for getting information is our Edge Tech website. Uh, that's our training website that we have set up. Um, you can also go to our YouTube channel. So if you just go to YouTube, just type in Nortec HVAC. Um, you'll see a whole list of videos there that I've done and some other guys in tech uh, that I've done. Um, uh, whether or not it's hands-on troubleshooting or sometimes we uh, we call it like weatherman style where we go over refrigeration circuits and, and look at superheat and subcooling and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, those would be the avenues I would point you guys to uh, as far as looking at uh, um, troubleshooting help and stuff like that. Uh, just going back to the, uh, just another reversing valve question, uh, just basically asked, uh, will we, is it normal to see a two to four degree difference across your refrigerant lines, whether you're in heat or cool mode? Uh, the answer to that question is yes. Um, that's what I want to tell guys on the field. Now, in our, in our video, when we did our, our hands-on troubleshooting, um, I had a little bit more than the two to four degree difference. Um, obviously, I, we, we saw that on our, on our gauge set. Um, mainly, I think that's due to just my conditions in the room. It was a lot cooler in that room than what you would normally see in, in a cooling mode uh, operation. And so with that, I had, a, I had a pretty low, what would be considered an outdoor ambient temperature. And then I had that fan going full blast to try to get as much warm air across the coil. Um, so then my return temperature, just kind of by default, was low. And then I didn't have a really long line set like you guys would normally in the field. So I had a little bit higher on my, on my, um, on my temperature split on the valve. Uh, I think that's mainly just due to the, the conditions I was working in. Uh, but the main thing that I tell guys is that the refrigerant on that reversing valve is basically just doing a U-turn. So it's going in one, one, uh, one side of the valve and, and coming out the middle. Um, so, or actually the other way around. So uh, going through the middle pipe and then out either the left or the right side of the pipe, depending on what mode you're in. Uh, but basically it's just doing a U-turn. Um, so you really shouldn't have that much temperature difference at all, um, especially in the field, because uh, normally you'll have a little bit longer line set. Your conditions are going to be more aptable, you know, whether you're in your heat or cool mode on that. Uh, so another uh, a troubleshooting tool that we do have for you guys is what we call our job checkout sheets. Uh, so basically what it is, is it's a two page document. These will be available on our literature library. And we have a heat pump um, version of this sheet and a AC. Basically the only thing that's different is the reversing valve um, that would be in the diagram. 
So uh, these are really helpful um, and it gives you a kind of a bird's eye view of what your system would look like. Um, and it gives little spots for you to input information as far as your suction line temperature, liquid line, what your pressures are, uh, helps you calculate your superheat and your subcooling. Um, and sometimes personally what I actually have to do is, is use one of those if a guy is hitting me with all these numbers and for some reason it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me on the phone. Um, and normally when I kind of have everything spread out on this job checkout sheet, I can normally find what my problem is or I can tell the tech to go back and, and retake a line temperature or, hey, we need to retake this pressure, make sure our, our gauge was screwed on all the way just to make sure we have an accurate reading. Um, but if you go under our literature website, um, those are available to you uh, to print out. It's just a, um, a PDF file. Uh, but those are really helpful because um, if you're not sure, um, you know what your sim or what your um, uh, your overall issue is, gathering what your readings are, and then looking at that from a from a, a you know a stand back perspective or a bird's eye view, um, sometimes it just clicks. So uh, that's another troubleshooting tool that I can I can point you guys to. Um, also, too, you guys are more than welcome to call into tech service. I just have some questions that are coming in in relation to compressor troubleshooting, um, when and when not to call into tech. Um, basically, if you guys have any questions in the field when it comes to compressor troubleshooting, charge, anything that you're working on, um, you know, feel free to call into tech service. Um, the, the group that I'm in is the residential group, um, so we'll definitely help you out in regards to anything uh, on the residential side, which would be up to five tons uh, worth of cooling. And then we do have a light commercial side um, as well. Um, but yeah, just feel free to call in um, if you have an issue in regards to troubleshooting or if you want to run something by us um, you know, for compressor troubleshooting or anything like that, uh, feel free to. So guys, so I think I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna wrap it up here. So uh, I appreciate all the questions um, that have uh, come in today. Um, I hope today's presentation um, in the lab was uh, beneficial to you. I kind of wanted to do something a little bit different. Um, I wanted to do a little bit of PowerPoint with hands-on troubleshooting because um, you know we're all trades guys. Um, we're all working on this equipment in the field every day, and, and sometimes it's a lot easier when you actually see somebody um, um, perform the task versus just looking at a PowerPoint. So um, I wanted to do it just a little bit different. So hopefully that was beneficial to you. Um, again, I'm gonna get with our communications department and see um, if we can get this uploaded to our ENOR site, which I'm sure it will, uh, Edge Tech, I mean, our Edge Tech site. Um, and then it might even be on our YouTube channel uh, for you guys to view as well. Uh, tomorrow, what we're going to be looking at is charging and, um, and how that applies to the field. So uh, tune in tomorrow and um, we'll also have a Q&A session. So if you have any questions, just we'll, we'll get to those. Uh, but thanks for tuning in, guys, and have a great day.